Welcome to the Axial Podcast. Axial is an early stage investment firm based in San Francisco. We partner with great founders and inventors investing in early stage life science companies often when they are no more than an idea. Axial is fanatical about helping the rare inventor who is compelled to build their own enduring business. And now, I think we're recording. Um, yeah, we're recording. So cool. Uh, Greg, well, great to have you here and have a conversation with you today. Um, I think I played a lot of basketball with you, and you're so good. You have an like, epic spin move. Um, your spin move like unstoppable. So <laughs> uh, we were just talking for like first 10 minutes here. Uh, but uh, yeah, great to have you here and excited to just talk about your story, your research, and what you're doing now. Uh, and maybe to start it off, yeah, no. do a brief intro and we can go from there. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for having me. And um, I don't know exactly how uh, epic any of my moves were, but uh, yeah, I do. Uh, also, Greg is the epic hustler. He will get every rebound, you know, he'll shoot, and then he'll, you have to box him out. And it's like, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drag to guard Greg. Um, I'm a big fan of guarding, like, there's a Friday basketball game at Berkeley. And um, I'm, I'm always a fan to guard Dave Raleigh or something. Uh, for what I lack in yeah, athleticism, yeah. Someone like that. I'm trying to guard the old professor, not not the young <laughs> freaking sprinter. We will talk about that. Uh but yeah, no, thanks for having me. And um uh yeah, I could just start out by talking sort of a little bit about um my journey and and um yeah, so I, I grew up in a small town in in uh Nebraska and did all the, you know, sort of prototypical small town things and really into like sports and the outdoors and hunting and fishing and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I think I was really interested in science early on and I was really um, lucky to have a mom who was a, actually a, she taught either kindergarten or first grade. And so that was cool because we had like summers off and it was like library time or museum time or, or stuff like that. So like she really like fostered like, learning and reading and all these things. And, and um, uh, my dad was, was mechanic. He was super like engineer hands-on. And I, I kind of did never got into that or caught onto that just cause I was so busy with uh, sort of sports and science interests, but sort of, you know, because I had that, that science interest, um, you know, kind of where, where I grew up, it's like, Oh, well, if you're interested in science, you should become a medical doctor and, and you kind of get like pushed that route and told that that's what you should do. And, um, uh, that thinking though kind of kind of changed when I ended up going to um, not to the University of Nebraska, the the, the large university with the the, the football team, uh, but I ended up going to a small uh, college, Nebraska Wesleyan University, that's also in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I kind of chose that for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I kind of uh, I didn't want to get lost in sort of the big shuffle of like a state school and. Um, my sister had actually went to, to Nebraska Wesleyan and had a really good experience there. And, um, yeah, and the other thing it was, it would actually allow me to keep doing sports. So I probably would have rather been a, a <laughs> point guard or quarterback on, in college or something, but I didn't have the, the skills to do that. But I had kind of picked up on like running, uh, late in high school and, um, the coach at Wesleyan, like kind of asked if I wanted to be on the cool. cross country and track team. So that was kind of another reason that was a draw to go. To go to Wesley, but um, you know, I think during my early time there, um, <clears throat> it became very clear to me that kind of the depth of my knowledge and things like chemistry and biology was was really thin. And it was like you know, when we the first couple of weeks and all these classes went through everything I kind of learned in high school, I was like, oh, there's there's more. And, and um, also, it was just incredible to me that um, people had done the research to figure all these things out. That was just like. Uh, uh, so interesting and so attractive to me, and it's like, oh, I want to, I want to do that. So, like earlier on, I, I, I knew that like um, being a medical doctor like wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do like research and figure things out. Uh, cool. And and so, um, yeah, being at this small university where I could uh, pester and harass all the 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 professors in my chemistry and biology courses, I took full advantage of that, and they they recognized that and. Um, I really owe them a debt of gratitude in terms of like helping me get into research. So um, one professor in particular, Dr. Um, Jody Ryder, she had um, 
she had done her graduate work at the University of Colorado in the biochemistry department there. Um, so actually, she reached out to some colleagues there and was like, I have this student um, in my chemistry courses that, that wants to do research. And so I actually spent um, two summers out there uh, in uh, Rob Kushta's lab in the biochemistry department doing um, uh, really cool research at the interface of, of chemistry and, and biochemistry. So I was synthesizing uh, nucleotide analogs. So I got doing actual um, cool. uh, organic synthesis chemistry and then doing biochemical assays with those to see how polymerases like decided how to incorporate nucleotides. So like, I was really interested in this interface um, at the, of chemistry and biology. And, um, but as I started to think about like what I wanted to work on in grad school, I was um, a little bit lost, um, but uh, I think um, uh, the thing that really uh, got me sort of interested in immunology and on the track to do that um, in my in my graduate career was um, so I was doing this running thing, but uh, I I had some um, injuries and I wanted to come back and run uh, cross country with my with my friends for a, for a fifth year of college, and so because of that, I had to like find a something to do for that that summer before um, uh, the last year of college. And and so I actually uh, want to do something other than, you know, go back to Colorado again. So I applied like across the country to all these like um, summer research programs. And, um, and this included um, this Amgen Scholars program at um, UC Berkeley. And, um, and the other thing that happened during that time was I took an immunology course. So Dr. Isaacson uh, at, at Westland um, really got me hooked on Hooked on this, and so when I took this immunology course and started learning about the immune system, it was like, oh, this is, you know, I want to study the molecular and biochemical details of, of, of this, and so that was one of the reasons I, I tried to get into this program at Berkeley because I knew they had a, a strong immunology program, and um, I didn't think I had much of a chance uh, getting into any of these <laughs> summer programs at a lot of places, but and I still remember when I asked them. Uh, uh, Audrey Knowlton, who was like the program coordinator, I think she still is the program coordinator at, at Berkeley of the Sam Jones Scholars Program. I asked her, like, you know, like, you know, why did you pick me? Or like, what stood out about my uh, application? And she's like, uh, well, we had never heard of your college before. So we thought, we thought you were interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess that's, yeah, a lesson to like, I'm like, whatever, I'll take it. That works. Um, uh, it's a lesson to just, uh, Shoot your shot, I guess. Yeah, it, like even if you, if you don't think you have a chance to, yeah. um, to uh, to make it to make it somewhere for something. Um, but yeah, that that whole summer experience at Berkeley kind of set my um, set me up to uh, for the path to come out to the Bay Area for grad school because I just really loved the Bay Area and and felt at home here and knew it's where I wanted to do my graduate work somewhere out here. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah, I think what makes you truly unique is your balance. You had for like so long balance two things being a world-class scientist and then trained to become a world-class runner and like just the time required and you have to be able to be so efficient um just like i mean i, I think probably audrey saw something where it's like you 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 a hard worker right just a lunch pail hard worker of a scientist and that's probably one thing maybe coming from a small school in nebraska is another way of saying greg's gonna work hard uh, and, and I think that's kind of the common theme in anything you do is like you just you're you're you're, getting, you're you're all hustle. You're just all you're just always you know at a hundred miles per hour and making things work. And I think that's going to be a common theme in your research and and also uh, just personally. Um, maybe we can talk more about like how was that initial ex experience? What, what was that process to choose Berkeley? You know, was Berkeley just like your number one choice? And was it obvious? And then when you got to Berkeley. How did you think about like, you know, figuring out what you, your your what problems you're excited about? Because um, you can say I'm excited about immunology, but holy smokes, that's really complex. Um, how did you hone in into like what problems you want to work on? Was it driven by the people? Was it driven by you know something you always you always were interested in? Yeah, yeah, I think it was definitely driven by the people and the type of research that we're doing in terms of the, the folks in the Berkeley and CV immunology, I always use the term like molecular immunology, like we're going to study the real uh, small nitty gritty details of, of the immune system. And so when I you know kind of started learning about that, that program and, and actually worked in the 
uh, during that summer, I worked in Nilab Shastri's lab, who um, unfortunately just recently passed away, but I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for being an amazing mentor um, that summer and then throughout my, my, my graduate work. But, but Nilab basically worked on like the very specific details of like how peptides get trimmed by peptidases and loaded and presented to on MHC class one molecules to, to be recognized by T cells. And so again, it's kind of back to this, like what are the molecular and biochemical details of how the immune system works. Like when I um, kind of saw research like that happening at Berkeley, that was um, um, kind of a, a new, that's a, like a type of environment I wanted to be in. Um, cool. And then, yeah, so once I like started grad school there and it's kind of funny, even though I kind of, um, you know, discussed or, or you know, talked about my interest in immunology, I kind of maybe ended up within the immunology department there in the least immunology lab. So I ended up in Mark Schlissel's lab, who if, if you think about it, Mark's lab was more of like a biochemistry slash developmental biology lab because his lab was focused on things like, um, you know, like the, the, the biochemistry of VDJ recombination and how you know, nucleases make DNA breaks or, or a lot of the kind of the part of the lab I was working in was more focused on uh, like the development of, of B cells from hematopoietic progenitors. So, kind of us thinking about like stem cell differentiation type um, problems, and then how that goes awry when 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 stem cells transform and become malignant cancers. So, um, I kind of uh, joined the the least immunology immunology lab at Berkeley, but yet I was in this environment where you had other labs working on um, things ranging from innate immunity and host pathogen interactions all the way to you know anti-cancer immunity and T cells. So it was just like a um, really great environment to to learn about a lot of different aspects of molecular immunology, but also um, you know, what I became really interested in at Mark's lab, which I kind of didn't know I was interested in before, was just very basic questions around um, how gene expression is controlled in cells. And that sort of become a really fascinating uh, thing to me and how how cells make decisions. And um, you know, this kind of the time I was in grad school was around the time when uh, uh sort of uh you know things like the yamanaka factors and and uh, stem cell reprogramming were all becoming very in vogue and um those type of questions like really um excited me and, and drove my research and and yeah i think my training in mark's lab um uh just really gave me a, a strong foundation in basic molecular biology and, and the other thing that happened in mark's lab is that he actually left um berkeley during uh third year of grad school. So I was kind of stuck in this uh, uh, decision making zone where, you know, the people above me, they the lab was going to be kept open and they could finish their their thesis work or their postdoc work, but the people below me had to make decisions to like change labs. And so I was kind of stuck in this um, place where I had to make a decision about whether I stay and try to push projects forward and um, take remote mentorship from Mark or, or whether I change labs. And um, I decided to stay. And I think that was actually really uh, important in that it um, made me really like, I think at the time I had mm -hmm. had this expectation that your mentor sort of would just guide you along and tell you all the things to do. And those things would, would uh, uh, years later lead you to uh, a thesis. But I think I took a little bit more ownership and decided that I kind of had to drive projects and, and make decisions, um, especially given now that like my, my mentorship was going to be um, remote. So I think it made me uh, sort of a more uh, independent scientist and thinker. And that kind of um, set me up really well for um, kind of the rest of my scientific career. Yeah. And when Mark left, was it, did you join TJ's lab as well? Or was that concurrently? Yeah. Uh, so Mark, Mark uh, kept the lab open for two years at Berkeley, but then towards the end of that time, I needed like an actual physical space to keep working cool. in. And so I ended up join uh, Teach's lab for the last um, uh, year of my grad work, in part because I also had a, a, a fellow student in my class who was kind of working on very similar um, questions, like a, how a transcription factor controlled cell fate yeah. decisions during B-cell development. So it was like a logical place to kind of end up. And it was actually kind of reinvigorating in, in ways to kind of go from this lab that was winding down and it was like not the most maybe fun place to be doing your yeah. uh, thesis work, but then jumping into this, this um, Sort of very, yeah, for context, um, you know, Robert Tejan, I think he biochemically characterized the first transcription factor, like AF1 or something, I forget the details. Uh, and then on this theme of 
you know, as a scientist growing, right, he's his mentor, but then he has to become more independent over time. You know, Tijin is definitely the deep end of that, that water, where at least at, you know, post, he became, he was president HHMI at the time, I think. And so, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. very hands off lab. <laughs> Um, yeah, but no, very thankful yeah. for for Tiege and yeah. letting me join his group for that year, and it was um, kind of yeah reinvigorated me a little bit to 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 um, be around that group, and it was a lot of fun. What and, question, and about the how, question I have about Tiege's lab? Was Claudia still there? Or Claudia was, was there? Yeah, Claudia. Yep. There's just these legends of Tiege. There's always, these labs always. Remember, I talk. I do a podcast with Claudia. There's always these kind of like people who actually run, who actually make a lab successful, and like people like I forgot her last name, but Claudia. And a few other folks um, who kind of drive success, but uh, cool. And then maybe we can talk more. And then you have this juncture in your career where you're running and you're having success in running. I've seen you run; you're really fast. You have great, you know, your arm motion. You've got like Usain Bolt arm motion. I don't know. I don't know what do you call this when the arm, like the what do you call this uh, when the arm goes back? Uh, it's probably a term for it. But you arm know, swing arm carriage. Arm know. swing. You know what I mean? I played football, and they're always yelling at me for arm swing um that's the most important part of running actually it's like, the, it's like you have to train yourself um in after grad school maybe you talk about some decisions you have to make about uh what you want to do and, and do you want to run do you want to advance your scientific career and how do you manage those and you figure out how to manage those both the, both those things some people end up having to choose one or the other you end up having both so how did you end up doing that yeah so um so kind of what Josh was alluding to is I kind of kept running throughout grad school and um, there was like, you know, various clubs around Berkeley. It was actually a really great environment because you had a lot of guys like me who had like ran uh, in, you know, small colleges and wanted to keep training. And so like I trained with a group of guys as part of this like Strawberry Canyon track club that was all like, you know, you had eight, nine, ten guys that um, uh, were all either doing their grad work or postdocs, but were like still pretty committed to like training together. And there's like a pretty... Um, intense like local circuit around the Bay Area of like road races and cross country races and we kind of committed to like doing that for a few years or at least as long as you know our partners and girlfriends wouldn't be mad that we're spending too much time running or something <laughs> um, but yeah so I kept doing this and like uh, it was going pretty well I was actually staying healthy and um, I kind of ran a so so there's something called the Olympic trials um marathon is basically this uh race where if you run a certain time in either the marathon or half marathon you are allowed into this race and then all those people are put onto the starting line to run and then the top three guys go to the olympics but if there's like a very wide range of of abilities that make it into this race so you can like barely qualify and then you'll go get beat by 10 minutes in this trials race where you can be like a pro runner but it's kind of like a badge of honor for um amateur runners to like qualify and make this race so i think i think at least um two runners for instance from my from my college nebraska wesleyan have qualified in my time if if not even more so it's yeah it's just something to like put on your resume and yeah. say you did oh i met this qualifying time and made it to the olympic trials and so i kind of ran a i'd never done much sort of longer distance running but towards the end of my grad school i ran a kind of a half marathon time that made me think, oh, if I, you know, committed to this and trained for a couple of years, I could maybe come close to meeting one of these qualifying standards to get into this race. So it's like, so if I wanted to actually do this, like how would I make this work? And so um, what I ended up doing is I knew that uh, uh, the immunology department of Berkeley had actually uh, hired to replace uh, Mark um, Karu Saijo, who was this incoming new professor. She had done her postdoc. Um, in Chris Glass's lab at UC San Diego, studying microglia and, and um, neurodegenerative disease. So she was coming in to start a lab um, in the immunology department. And so I just reached out to Kairu and I said, hey, would you, you know, want to hire me as your lab manager, or lab technician or whatever, and I help you get this, the lab set up? I want to kind of focus on um, uh, and, and, and uh, um, uh, oh yeah, when, when this, Olympic trials, which uh, was, I think in 2016 is comes around and either make it or don't make this qualifying time, then I'll, you know, go interview and move on and find a postdoc somewhere. She's like, sure. So I basically ended up joining Karu's lab as um, uh, her, her lab manager and help her kind of get the lab set up. Um, cool. So kind of keeping my mind in, uh, in science, um, but kind of focusing on running. And it, it was actually 
kind of a really um it was really a beneficial time because to be honest i actually didn't really know what i wanted to work on <laughs> in my postdoc i was kind of feeling a little bit lost again um so it kind of gave me a chance to think about that and it also gave me a chance to like learn some new skills actually so like karu kind of asked me to um so the glass lab is kind of famous for doing a lot of like these next generation sequencing things like grow seek and chip seek and and and, and whatnot rna seek and so she kind of asked me to uh, learn all these things so that they would be kind of up and running in her lab and so um it was actually a beneficial kind of time for me when i could take the time to to um uh learn those types of things and employ them in, in my own toolkit and use them going forward cool. yeah so that's awesome i think i mean sometimes you know like I, mean, I think maybe running helps you, you know, give you space. And I'm, I'm assuming you're running. I, I run, but I run like three miles. And that's that's all I can run. Beyond that, it gets very boring. And I'm assuming someone like you. I have friends who run long distance as well. It's a time to reflect. What do you when you're running? What do you think about? Are you just thinking about? Sometimes when I'm running, I'm like, man, I need to, my breath. But you, something like of your, you know, of, of your talent, um, when you're actually running on the seventh mile are you like in the zone or are you thinking are you like reflecting on things yeah that's that's uh, yeah i mean it depends on the day and like what you're doing and how hard you're running but if i'm just out for like a casual run like no i would like i'm more than likely i'm thinking about science and it's my time cool. to to think and reflect on that and kind of talk to myself and and um cool. you know talk through hypotheses and why or why not that things may be this way yeah. or not this way yeah, I'm assuming yeah. running helps you i mean i have friends I have, oh for sure yeah all yeah. my i have so many you know like whether you spoke about this i have so many friends who are world-class chemists and they almost all run like but like really like uh high high like high level running uh but maybe we can transition towards your key work you know you had a nature metabolism paper i got published in 2020 uh, and I remember kind of seeing it kind of near the end of it. And it was really, you had this preprint and you got to nature. Uh, and so you really made some awesome discoveries around the role of monochromesis in macrophage metabolism and fate and, and function. And just for some quick background, monochromesis is just kind of quite simply, you know, mitochondria create kind of reactive oxygen species, things that could be damaging. And, and, and a little bit of damage is actually valuable. Uh, too much then ends up becoming harmful. That's kind of the hormetic response. So you kind of establish this kind of uh, phenomenon in macrophages. Uh, and I think it's a great story. Maybe you can talk about how that project got started. Because you're in Sanjo's lab. But Sanjo's focused on microglia. She has no business in this field. And so, you know, how did you get from this starting point that's kind of related but kind of not connected to this whole different field? I think that's kind of the the great part of the story yep yeah so um so 2016 came and went and i was interviewed for some postdocs and other places but kind of nothing really um interested me and um so when 2017 rolled around i had to decide you know what i wanted to do uh, i actually ended up just staying in Kairu's lab and transitioning over to being a postdoc. And part of the reason for that was because we had um, stumbled upon this um, sort of interesting and, and uh, mysterious observation um, uh, very recently. And that was, uh, so So Kairu had been studying um, sex hormones, which normally work through um, sex hormone receptors. She had primarily been studying estrogens and how they work through the estrogen receptors in microglia to modulate their sort of inflammatory tone and and just sort of demonstrated that, that could um, supplementing specific estrogens could um, uh, beneficially modulate like neuroinflammatory disease and um, we had sort of had reasoning to ask a similar question um, uh, uh, for not for microglia the the macrophages of the brain but just for macrophages in general because they actually express some different nuclear hormone receptors than than microglia that i'm talking about the macrophages perfectly in the body so basically just did the screen of, of um, endogenous estrogen metabolites and we're asking how they uh, influence uh, um, macrophage inflammation, such as like inflammation driven by like toll-like receptors. That was kind of the screen. Um, and this was like an important question to ask in general because this, this field was actually kind of um, uh, 
conflicting in terms of whether people thought estrogens were pro or anti-inflammatory. And, and, and then also this was also during a time when um, and people still are making this push that we need to actually um, uh, be more equitable in how we study um, uh, biological male and female inflammatory responses, because we know the, the, that um, the immune responses in biological males and females are very different and that sex hormones probably play a big role in this. So we should probably know more about how estrogen influences uh, inflammation. And so we did a screen where we put all these endogenous estrogens on to macrophages, um, treated them with LPS, this toll-like receptor ligand that induces like a pro-inflammatory macrophage phenotype. And um, we found that this particular class of estrogen metabolites, these hydroxyestrogens, were really anti-inflammatory. Um, but the surprising thing came when um, I did the experiments where either antagonist or I did the experiment of macrophages that lacked the estrogen receptor, and we found the act the anti-inflammatory activity of these hydroxyestrogens was actually still there, meaning that it was a um, uh, estrogen receptor, a hormone receptor independent effect that we were observing. Um, so we're kind of left with this puzzle and and it's the puzzle that I kind of you know committed to to trying to figure out when I decided to stay in Kairos lab and 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 um, do a postdoc there. And um, yeah, it, kind of how it started to relate to to mitohormesis and these hormetic responses is that when I, when I started looking at the literature about what was known about these hydroxyestrogens, um, it became very clear that they had this reputation for being uh, evil because they they uh, could themselves like directly oxidize proteins or they could actually do this do this thing called redox cycling where they can snatch electrons and give them the oxygen and and make their own reactive oxygen species. So I kind of initially was like, oh, oh crap, we this is like some like um, toxic effect where these these things are just you know causing oxidative damage to the macrophages and and um, maybe killing them and that's why we're seeing this anti-inflammatory but that wasn't the case so what it, actually what I ended up talking about in the paper is how the the um, the hydroxyestrogen treated macrophages actually because of this oxidative stress that they generate they actually becoming become more resistant to um, to uh, subsequent oxidative stress so it wasn't the case where this was a, a toxic effect it was this uh, hormetic effect that Josh kind of alluded to. Um, but, um, you know, the, the way we related this to, um, macrophage metabolism was that, you know, this was, um, I kind of had a, a hunch that, um, sort of macrophage metabolism and, and, uh, was involved in the anti-inflammatory effect, but kind of at the time looking through the literature, it was, um, it was kind of unclear about how exactly that worked. And that was, I think in a large part because, um, immunologists for for whatever reason love to do like overnight time points so they like to like stimulate macrophages with things and then the next day like look at uh, cytokine production or gene expression but if you looked at the people who were studying things like the acute macrophage pro-inflammatory gene transcription um, downstream of things like total receptor ligands they would they would study these these things at um uh you know minutes or hours time points um uh, because that's when changes in initial changes in metabolism would happen and uh, things like uh, opening of chromatin and initial transcription of pro-inflammatory genes would happen. So there was like this, this coordinates between um, uh, sort of how the macrophage phenotype was being studied, but yet all the stuff was happening a lot faster than, than people really appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of had to work backwards and, and look at um, how these hydroxyestrogens were affecting this really initial metabolic reprogramming in these macrophages. And we basically found that it um, sort of uh, this oxidative stress that, that they were causing um, by either directly oxidizing proteins or generating their own, their own uh, reactive oxygen species um, seemed to be uh, disrupting uh, specific metabolic fluxes that were important for supporting the inflammatory response. Mainly it was, it was inhibiting the, uh, utilization of glucose by mitochondria in the macrophages because the mitochondria are early on during the inflammatory response are sort of this biosynthetic hub where they take glucose and make things that support an inflammatory response, uh, including this um, metabolite um, acetyl-CoA, which is important for uh, the first step of the inflammatory response, which is uh, acetylating histone so that the, the pro-inflammatory genes could be turned on. Um, so yeah, we sort of characterize how these hydroxyestrogens were causing this um, oxidative stress uh, both sort of acutely suppress that flux. And then they would also cause this hormetic response that would sort of totally rearrange macrophage metabolism and shut down that mitochondrial glucose utilization. Um, 
which is something that actually naturally happens as macrophages um, uh, when I are exposed to like a, a toll-like receptor ligand, they sort of undergo this inflammatory response, but then they shift over to this tolerized phenotype. And so we um, sort of set up this model where um, this oxidative stress might be important for promoting this sort of metabolic shift in the macrophages that enforces this tolerance. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's a conceptually, um, you know, people always ask me, they're like, well, you know, ox ROS and oxidants are always thought to be pro-inflammatory in macrophages. Like, how can it be that you're saying they're anti-inflammatory? And, and, and I guess I'm not saying that those things have to be <laughs> mutually exclusive because, uh, you know, a lot of biological pathways, um, for instance, like NF-kappa B signaling, like NF-kappa B signaling happens, but it also has neg negative feedback built into it. So like, for instance, some of the targets of NF-kappa B are actually like um, negative regulators of NF-kappa B signaling. So I figured uh, if if biological pathways like NF-kappa B signaling can be both activating and simultaneously repressing, then why can't um, signaling by reactive oxygen species be the same way? So I, I definitely think uh, certain aspects of, of ROS production during Early inflammatory responses by macrophages do promote um, things like inflammatory signaling. There's some great work by a friend, um, uh, uh, Mark Erb, in, um, that actually talks about how oxidants uh, support um, uh, aspects of pro-inflammatory signaling. But I figured, why can't it be both? Why can't those oxidants also be involved in feedback that shuts off the inflammatory response? So yeah. I think that's kind of this non-intuitive discovery. And it's, it's just like it's a consequence of this really profound observation of like, okay, these hydroxyextrogens are promoting an anti-inflammatory phenotype independent of the estrogen receptor. And so like you have to spend years, all of this experience, I can imagine all of the like excitement, but the grind to have to figure out, okay, how is this actually working? And that's kind of the, the exciting part of science. And then, you know, you have, you have to kind of rebuild almost um, what, you know, like sometimes people start from a target and they can figure it all out based on existing discoveries. You kind of have to rebuild it. You have to rebuild the universe yourself uh, based on this one observation that was non-intuitive. And you do all these experiments to validate and double check. Uh, and that's kind of the the, the hard part. Um, and I think maybe one thing we could maybe dive a little deeper into is, is more around like, um, you know, macrophages exist in two main states, M1, M2. I always forget which one's pro-inflammatory. I think it's M1 or it's M2. Yeah, so, yeah, M1. people, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, you're saying dirty words to some people now because people are trying to get rid of that nomenclature, but I actually, I'm <laughs> fine, like, whatever, like, it's, I'm fine with it because I think, um, I think the two main states, I think mac uh, macrophages exist in various other states, but the, the, main, the two main states I was taught is M1, M2. Maybe it's yep. changed now. Yeah, so it's thought that these you know, inflammatory macrophages, which which I was studying, they can, they're definitely good. They can help you um, initiate the inflammation that helps repair a wound or helps you get rid of a pathogen. But it's thought that those M1 macrophages are the ones that go off track and uh, promote you know, disease driving inflammation and things like cardiovascular disease or arthritis or neurodegeneration or um, uh, like early on in, in, a, in a septic shock response. Yeah. Um, but then you have this, on the other hand, you have these, these pro repair macrophages that <laughs> would be normally um, important for things like um, healing a wound or healing damaged tissue after an infection. But that since, because those macrophages are inherently have a different job, not to, to do inflammation, but to do wound repair, um, those macrophages can maybe be bad in certain contexts. So for instance, mm -hmm. like in, Contexts like cancer, those macrophages might um, uh, uh, be not supportive to anti-tumor immunity, and, and, and in processes like cancer, you might actually want to. That's been pretty. I think it's pretty well appreciated. You might want to actually promote a pro-inflammatory macrophage phenotype mm -hmm. in cancer. Um, so yeah, just it was a, uh, um, as you said, sort of a uh, a situation where I had sort of a pharmacological phenotypic effect, but I had to kind of like work backwards and maybe a non-intuitive way to kind of figure out what's going on. And, and, um, it's so I, yeah. hard. That is so hard. I mean, yeah, that takes some, like, that's like science that was done in the sixties, you know, like there's some old school, like non, like just not knowing. And there's like, just seen a phenotype and have to figure it all out. Like that is like brutally hard. Most, most, most of the time now you have a target, you kind of know what you were looking at. Um, they can kind of build from there. Um, but maybe we can talk more around like how your work kind of like 
tips the balance and kind of not kind of uh, incre increases our understanding of these different macrophage states and how they're relevant in disease. And so, you know, your work kind of shows that a little bit of stress can, you know, shift the shift the the, 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 the scales of macrophage or shift shift the state of macrophage towards an anti-inflammatory state. Um, and what what does that well what does that mean for disease and maybe our understanding of immunity? Um, that like a little bit of stress can actually shift uh, at least a macrophage to a different state. Yeah. Um... So yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. I, the, the first thing I was going to say, kind of relation to all of this, is that you know I owe like a huge debt of gratitude to like the folks that had worked out all these mitohormetic mechanisms, <laughs> which had primarily been worked out in like in like yeast and yeah. and C. elegans. So I, I started reading. It was funny. I started reading a whole bunch of literature literature by this guy named Michael Ristow, who had kind of coined the term mitohormesis in some of his. Um, C. elegans work and then it was funny he ended up writing like a preview of the paper and sort of um asking bigger picture cool. questions that you're kind of alluding to but um yeah i think it raises this it was sort of going back to what i said that about thinking about um reactive oxygen species in general and whether they are pro or anti-inflammatory and like i'm saying I, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive but you know it's very clear in clinical trials across multiple inflammatory diseases that what we think are antioxidants have not been successful in any of those. So that says that, um, you know, my work kind of raises the question that not only might those antioxidants um, not work, but they might actually be detrimental to um, the process of, of how ROS might promote suppression of inflammation naturally. Um, so that's kind of a, I think a larger uh, kind of bigger picture um, concept to, that, that my work kind of um, raises some questions about. And, yeah. And then, yeah, the other, uh, just from like a therapeutic standpoint, it kind of, um, as you said, raises the, uh, this counterintuitive notion, as you say, that like a little, um, you know, we don't really, t just as when I initially read about these hydroxyestrogens and started seeing that they were evil because they cause oxidative stress and, and that I was like, oh my gosh, like, what, what am I getting myself into? But maybe we should, should actually um, not be afraid of, of pharmacologies that do things like that. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's kind of a, a atypical way of thinking in terms of like, if you could, uh, uh, design maybe, uh, molecules that, that cause stress in the right place and right time. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. what makes your work truly unique and the history of like science and immunology in particular is I see worms. Right, there's always been all these experiments for a few decades around ROS, reactive oxygen species, and playing around with lifespan of worms. Right, so okay, a little bit of ROS can actually increase the lifespan of worms by X amount. And there's all these cool data points out there, and then your Nature Metabolism paper, at least in my perspective, and knowing the field decently well, is like you kind of were the first to connect that observation that was in worms and yeast to like. A human cell, a, a, a macrophage. You know, it's kind of this like big leap, and it's a non-intuitive leap, um, and and it kind of opens up a whole can of worms of like how much damage is valuable. <laughs> you know what I mean? And how much stress is is useful to to change uh, an immune cell's fate and and function. Um, and maybe you talk about more. How do you think about translating that work? Right, this idea of hormetic drugs seems really like a, a it's like a, a evil term like a, a no-no term for some drug developers but like how do you think about this idea of like okay, how do you translate these discoveries into maybe something that could be potentially become a cancer drug down the line and what are the challenges to try to drug a hermetic pathway or um you know take advantage of it yeah so that's kind of one um i think i've been interested in and and I think it gets challenging in, into um, thinking about whether this hormetic response that I described is caused by uh, generalized stress or whether there is actually more specific um, targeting of specific protein or proteins and that that's kicking off this hormetic response. And because I think when you talk about a generalized stress response, there's, yeah, like you said, the, the drug developers or the, uh, the, the people in pharma, they always want a specific target and biomarkers. And yet I'm describing kind of a, uh, a bigger picture holistic response, but, but maybe it's not actually that way. And maybe there are actually 
um, specific targets that are being hit, say, by these hydroxyestrogens that are actually, um, it's actually the driver of this of this response. Um, and that's actually something I've been investigating a little bit uh, uh, outside of uh, uh, my um, academic work. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically trying to know if if there is actually a specific target of these hydroxyestrogens, if we knew this target and information about it could actually help us design um, uh, therapeutics to either inhibit or, or degrade that target and sort of kick off the same response that uh, um, that I'm describing in, in the in the microbiosis paper. Yeah, cool. um, I think there's just a lot of work left to be done here, and it's very non-intuitive. That's the thing. Immunology is already hard, and now you're adding this whole other thing on top of it. It just makes it so much harder to grok and figure out. Um, and so uh, maybe we can transition more towards like what you're doing now. And you published a paper earlier this year around macrophage metabolism. And what you do, and, and you kind of move to UCSF to, um, to do a postdoc. Then we can talk about research there and what you're working on. Yeah. So, you know, if I had to sort of like boil down what excited me most about um, kind of following up on the mitohormesis work, so the the mitohormetic work kind of talks about how these hydroxyestrogens sort of uh, disrupt or short circuit this mitochondrial glucose utilization, this sort of um, anabolic metabolism that the, the macrophages use to mount an inflammatory response. And, and um, but I actually became more interested in this uh, observation we made that this supplementation of, of macrophages um, with this um, uh, metabolic cofactor coenzyme A, which, which actually um, would overcome the anti-inflammatory effects of the hydroxyestrogen by basically um, reinvigorating um, mitochondrial glucose oscillation. So basically helping macrophages um, utilize glucose to, to do the anabolic things they need to do to, to build an inflammatory response. Um, we basically found that this, not only could this CoA supplementation like reverse this pharmacological effect that I discovered, but um, I became really excited when I found that this CoA supplementation could actually um, sort of reinvigorate these tolerized or, or mm -hmm. M2, to me, they're kind of this, the same flavor of macrophage, but these sort of like immunosuppressed macrophages that are more worried about suppressing inflammation and rebuilding a tissue, it could actually, CoA supplementation could actually um, uh, uh, sort of revert them back to the inflammatory state where they could utilize glucose um, in the mitochondria to mount an inflammatory response. And, and that to me was very exciting from a, because in some ways I almost think that's a, um, a harder problem to, to crack and that's and, and maybe a more important problem to crack because you know the the, the mortality in terms of, of cancer or things like late stage sepsis and the immunosuppression that happens there it's it's a really large burden so if you can figure out a way to sort of um, reinvigorate uh, innate immunity with this coA supplementation that was um, something I really wanted to follow up on and so that's kind of what I've been doing uh, that was one of the reasons I moved to to Val Weaver's lab at UCSF because she'd had she's taken a big interest in how these um, anti-inflammatory, pro-repair, pro-resolving macrophages support and drive tumor genesis. And so I kind of came to Val um, and, and said, you know, I think I have a way to sort of, uh, via this CoA supplementation, a, a way to uh, reinvigorate the pro-inflammatory response to these macrophages and sort of reorient them back to a more inflammatory state. And I wanna know if that could work as a uh, anti-cancer therapeutic. And, and also I've kind of kept in touch with, um, plenty of friends in, in Berkeley and so I've also been working with them. Um, uh, so it's thought that in a lot of like chronic infections that, uh, especially infections where um, the pathogen uh, likes to uh, counterintuitively live and replicate inside of macrophages that um, this, this similar sort of immunosuppression and tolerance happens in those macrophages and it allows those macrophages to create a, a replicative niche. And so I, I also have been working with um, Russell Vance here at UC Berkeley to ask the question about whether this co CoA supplementation, which we've shown in Val's lab, can make a macrophage more inflammatory anti-tumor, whether it could also make a more uh, inflammatory antimicrobial macrophage. And so we've been cool. working on this CoA supplementation and how it helps macrophages um, uh, restrict and kill uh, Legionella pneumophila, which is this um, uh, intracellular uh, uh, bacteria that the Vance lab uses to, to study host passage interactions. So, so yeah, I've, I've basically been doing the, the other side of the coin of now I'm not trying to suppress inflammation, but I'm trying to now promote yeah. uh, an inflammatory macrophage phenotype. And, but, but I think bigger picture going back to like, you know, what is the, 
the larger um, term implications of all this. Like, I think now that I've, you know, convinced myself that I can uh, sort of suppress or, or promote these phenotypes via manipulating um, macrophage metabolism, I hope that this makes, you know, um, I think, as you said, this is like a, uh, immunology is already complicated enough, and then you throw metabolism on top of it, yeah. but I hope this makes kind of people, you know, maybe appreciate the, uh, um, the power of, of modulating uh, metabolism in terms of controlling cellular phenotypes, and that it's not a, a um, passive player in things, but it, it actively controls the cell fate decisions of these, of these cells. Um, cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I didn't know. Well, congrats on collaborating with Russell Fans, right? He's like the, the legend in sea gas and innate immunity. Uh, and I think, yeah, in general, right, studying the metabolism of immune cells is very ripe and, and open to feel to then maybe make drugs to modulate that metabolism. And then, and, and, and of those immune cells, and ultimately, which will affect uh, not only cancer, but like any inflammatory disease. And so, the, the, the kind of the, implications and, and, and the value is like very broad. Um, I think the hard part is like trying to, uh, um, the immune system is very context dependent. And so, you know, you have to like study this macrophage in this environment, the state, you know, and so it's a very, very hard labor, but if you can figure out the right one, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of potential discoveries and drugs to be made. But the next few years, maybe we'll wrap it up, next few years, or you've been building up, right, from Nebraska, you know, getting exposure to chemistry, then immunology, uh, you know, becoming an expert in macrophage metabolism. What do you see in the next few years? Uh, do, do you want to go a particular direction? Do you want to, like, say, do you want to, like, make a drug candidate? Do you want to uh, try to uh, explore another field of uh, macrophages? Or do you want to go to different immune cells? What, what do the next few years look like? Yeah, that's a interesting question that um, I'm kind of trying to figure out right now. Yeah. So I've, I've kind of been on the job market since last year and have been applying for jobs and cool. um, have had or ha have some interviews lined up for like academic positions. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of one route I'm pursuing. Cool. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I think I've been very um, fortunate and um, from the standpoint that kind of uh, uh, all my research has involved sort of these like pharmacological effects that have, you know, beneficial um, biological effects in, in the systems I've been studying. And so that's kind of gotten me really interested in the um, the, the world of, of biotech and pharma and drug cool. development and like, okay, I have these interesting effects, how would I actually turn them into to therapeutics? And so I've also been, um, kind of as I alluded to with the hydroxyestrogen stories, I've been thinking on the side, kind of pursuing, um, avenues and ways to make that a reality um, in, in my own company. And so, cool. yeah, uh, what the future holds is very uh, uncertain right now. But um, I would, yeah, just say I have have some options and I'm excited about all the options and whether they work separately or together, or like, I don't know how it's going to go. I saw their work. I think a common thing for you is just like the, the amount of work, the, the, the hard work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Always, always getting rid of your all in anything you do. And I think that's going to, you've made some really awesome discoveries. I think that's kind of just trying to unravel that more and more. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to unveil some really great opportunities, maybe in academia, maybe in, 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 in a you know, in industry setting and in startup. I think, you know, I think, I think as an entrepreneur, you have so much potential, Well, maybe both. And so I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. We'll touch base in like two years and then we'll see what's going on. Right. And I think it's kind of the idea, right. We'll do some updates every now and then. Um, but Greg, thanks for doing this. It's just kind of really hear your story. I think you have an incredible, unique story out of all the scientists I meet and you kind of be able to balance so much in your life and mainly being a, being a scientist is already hard enough. Doing, doing world-class science is like more than a full-time job. And then be able to like train for run. Oh, one last question. I, never, I, I actually never know the answer to this either. How did you place, did you get to the qualifiers? How did you place? No, I ended up uh, I ended up getting injured and having to have uh, oh. a hip surgery. So oh. yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, okay. I, Maybe... I have an issue with overdoing it sometimes. So it's I my, know. Okay, <laughs> it's my other problem. Called so. worker. You just overdo uh, it. Uh, we got to get you the qualifiers then. 
Yeah, you know that, that might be, those days might be. Those days are over. Behind me, yeah. Maybe I don't know if I have like, time to do. I'm assuming they have. I had a I had a friend of mine. Uh, there's like the over fifty Olympics or something. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe Greg. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm I'm just trying to keep my body together, and then I can <laughs> maybe make a. This is the, what they call it, like masters running. You know, yeah, I think I can, Greg I can make a comeback there. Yeah, make a comeback in the masters running. I think yeah. I think that's kind of the that's the game plan now. Is yeah, yeah. the, the, the uh, master goals. goals? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think you could do it. Okay, I'll, I'll see you at Kezar probably one of these days. Um, yeah. But great to do this, uh, and we'll do the uh, and and uh, we'll we'll do this a few years from now and get the update. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Greg.